So WWE Great Balls of Fire is officially in the books, and it was an interesting, weird kind of night. First off, I want to say thanks to those of you that did your best to join in the movement to try to get hashtag WWE Balls trending on Twitter. It didn't happen, but I smell a Twitter conspiracy. We'll make it happen soon enough, believe me, but thank you. I don't know if we're going to look back and think of this show as a big ball of fire or more like tepid testes or smoldering nuts. I really don't know. But there were parts of the show that I really, really liked. Some parts I thought were done well and some parts that were really a letdown. So I'm just going to run through the match card now and kind of give you my thoughts. And let's see what we can make out of what happened tonight. The pre-show had the Cruiserweight title match with Tozawa challenging Neville. The match was fun. Titus was really good as a hype man. The crowd really got behind Tozawa. Uh, you never had any thought that Tozawa was actually going to win, but you mixed in some nice hope spots here. Neville is the king of the cruiserweights, and that's pretty much it. You got what you got out of a pre-show match. Although, do we really need to run advertisements for WWE Network crap during matches airing on the WWE Network that are part of a pay-per-view? Just saying. So you get to the main card, and I'm glad they started off with Seth Rollins and Bray Wyatt because, really, frankly, who gave a crap about this? And if you're Seth Rollins, you got to be getting conflicting signals from the office because, on the one hand, you've been a multi-time world champion, you're the poster boy for the 2K18 video game, and yet here you are jobbing to Bray Wyatt. This match was mediocre. They never got me invested in any way. These characters are mediocre. They don't get me invested in any way. So it feels kind of appropriate. It was one big who fucking cares. We got it done. And frankly, now Bray can do what he was setting out to do all night. Hurry up and get through the damn match so he can put his hashtag WWE balls on JoJo's chin. Yeah, that's right. I said it. Anyways, Enzo Amore and Big Cass. I'm sorry, but if my best friend betrays me, is almost paramount to your lady cheating on you, or if you're a lady, your dude cheating on you, or if you swing the same side of the fence, your significant other cheating on you. I really don't think you're going to be dancing and laughing and joking and yucking and cucking and all that other crap. You're going to be pissed. You're going to be looking for blood and revenge. Um, so it's weird to see Enzo still doing the dancing crap. I thought his promo was poorly timed, even though the content of it was very good. It was very long. If anything, though, I will say this. I wish he would have kept talking through Kaz's entrance music. That shit was terrible. Absolutely terrible. It sounded like 90s WCW jobber heel music. It was horrible. Uh, Enzo's promo, it felt like, was longer than the match because I believe it was. And that's probably how it should be. Because you're in one of these situations. you got to have some type of blow-off uh, to the story. And, of course, you rushed into this and split these guys up too soon. But ultimately, you had to do something. You didn't make Enzo look like a total bitch, but in no way, shape, or form did you make the casshole look like he was in any real threat or danger. Get in, do what you need to do, get it over, and move the fuck on. And that's exactly what they did here. So it was well executed, if nothing else. The tag team Iron Man match between the Hardys and Sheamus and Cesaro, at least the Hardys got a pre-match interview. That's an improvement. I just can't believe you bring in these guys with all the hype that you had for WrestleMania. It was really the highlight of WrestleMania when these guys came back after so many years of being gone. And you've done everything you can to butcher it and make them feel like just another WWE tag team. That's inexcusable. That shit shouldn't happen. And frankly, with this match, there's too little story to really care. And too many times of the different parties touching and the teams touching... For me to really want to see them wrestle yet again and wrestle for an even longer defined period of time, a half an hour. And the first 20 minutes of this match were pretty mediocre. The last 10 minutes were really good. I don't know what the hell was up with, at that one point with the ref and where the screw up came in. He counted to three, but then we pretended like he didn't. And at least the crowd ca <laughs> caught on and chanted, that was three, that was three. It was just weird, but I thought we were going on to the whole either uh, Warriors, Cavs crap from a couple of years ago. They're going to choke off a 3-1 deficit, and here come the baby faces, the Hardy Boys, come back to win. Or we were going to get a tie, or it was going to end up being a draw, or we were going to get sudden death. But they didn't do that. I thought the finish was executed really well, and that was about the best part of it. Like I said, the last 10 minutes were good, uh, so it leaves a good impression. But now, what the hell do you do with the Hardys? And then what's next for Sheamus and Cesaro? I really don't know. Uh, one pleasant surprise of the night was the Raw Women's Championship. 
I feel really bad for Sasha Banks because she was getting fucked up here in all types of different ways. This match was low-key brutal. It felt real. And maybe that's because these two have some heat, have some tension between them. I don't know. But either way, I was enjoying it. It felt real. In a world of scripted, choreographed, fucking flips and kicks and spots, this match felt like these two wanted to beat the hell out of each other. And part of that was because sometimes Alexa still doesn't know what the hell she's doing, and she frankly is beating the hell out of Sasha Banks. And we always got to go to the back with Sasha Banks, that poor thing. Uh, and I understand doing the whole Alexa chooses to get counted out, how ironic the big Eddie Guerrero fan has an Eddie Guerrero finish pulled on her, but it's still a letdown. It's, it's more of like, uh, fuck that shit heat as opposed to fuck Alexa Bliss heat is kind of the way I see it. You could have done this where Sasha actually knocked out Alexa Bliss and she didn't answer the 10 count. Um, you could have had both of these ladies fighting outside of the ring and there was a double count out. Maybe that would have been more effective. Um, but even if you say, well, you know, that's a heel and that's what heels do. I'm not saying that it's not. And I'm not saying it was a terrible thing. I'm just saying when you watch a match like that that was undercover pretty good and felt pretty real, if it, it was a letdown. These types of finishes are always a letdown, even if they serve a greater purpose. So I'm not going to back down from saying it was a letdown. Match was good. Finish was meh. And how often do we say that about WWE matches, frankly? The build-up, the wind-up was really good, and then when it came time for the nut, it kind of petered out. That's exactly what happened. Speaking of petering out, Dean Ambrose. I, you know, I would rather Dean Ambrose wash his hashtag WWE balls and his ass than get another title shot of any kind anytime soon. And apparently during the match, Dean's got some really bad gingivitis too with his bleeding ass gums. So apparently he needs to not only wash his hashtag WWE balls, but uh, brush his teeth and use some mouthwash. But this match just was kind of there. The ringside crew, you have Maurice involved, you have Bo Dallas involved, Curtis Axel involved. They were used well, and all is right ultimately because of Miz One. But we need to move past this and find somebody else for the fucking Miz to feud with. It's that simple. Because you're just looking at it and you're like, this is the mid-card MVP of WWE against one of the biggest wastes of space. You know, it's like... Somebody like a Dean Ambrose is really pining for the position of taking Dolph Ziggler's spot. Where there's some people that still stubbornly cling on to the fact that they think the guy is really good. And most everybody else has come to the realization that the guy doesn't care and he fucking sucks now. That's kind of where we're at with this. Um, but I, honestly, like I was said in the preview, it was about the two money matches. It was about the ambulance match and the universal title match. And how those two matches went was ultimately how I was going to feel about the night. So the ambulance match, Roman Reigns, Braun Strowman. I enjoyed the hell out of this match. I thought this match was outstanding. I felt it like it was two guys that legitimately hate each other, social media pictures of them together overseas aside. I really enjoyed it. I thought they did just about everything they needed to in the time that they had. You know, they incorporated the ambulance. They went into the f fucking uh, ramp, and Roman pushes Braun through the goddamn LED screens. The one question I have and maybe I'm just drawing a blank here, but all that shit that Braun did to the table, did they ultimately ever use the commentary table? If so, why waste your time setting up that spot? I just legitimately don't remember. And I could be ass wrong, but I just don't remember. Um, but the finish and the way they did it was well done in terms of Braun stepping aside as Roman's trying to spear him into the ambulance and Roman goes into the ambulance. So Braun Strowman wins. Of course, Roman Reigns throws a bitch fit. And he ends up putting Braun into the fucking ambulance to do the whole thing of what's Roman going to do. He's driving off with Braun in the ambulance and he backs into this shit. Um, and the commentators, of course, talk about, I've never seen anything like that. You know, like when Stone Cold Steve Austin, Survivor Series 2000, dropped Triple H off of a freaking uh, a forklift or whatever the hell it was. On, and the car went down like this. Yeah, we've never seen anything like that. Hulk Hogan calling for a truck to fucking run into the ambulance that the Rock is sitting in. We've never, ever seen any shit like this before. I wish they wouldn't pretend like this is the first time we've ever seen it. I wish, if anything, they would bring up stuff like that to compare it like that. Because, if anything, it's legend by association. You're doing crap that some of the greatest people in the history of the business, in the history of the company, have done. That helps cement those guys. Stop insulting fans' intelligence when they know better. That's just frustrating to me. 
But what else is frustrating is, once this is all said and done, and especially once eventually they get the Jaws of Life and Braun comes stumbling out like he's 3 a.m. drunk but he still wants more, you know, people are talking about, is this a double turn? Did they turn Braun babyface here? Did they turn Roman heel here? First of all, Braun's been working face the entire time, frankly, he's been associated with Roman Reigns. He's not turning face. He already is a babyface. It's just simply a matter of cementing the status now. And as far as Roman Reigns goes, I mean, to really keep try to keep him and force him as a babyface seems illogical here because a guy tried to commit attempted murder, at the very least, vehicular assault. But, you know, to sit there and say Roman Reigns is going to be a heel, the WWE is still going to push him the way they're going to push him. I don't really see how this becomes a double turn where Roman is actually going to be booked like a heel. He's just going to be a heel in terms of crowd reactions. This didn't really change a whole lot. It just, if anything, cemented the reactions that both of these guys were getting. It was a big night for both of these guys, but in particular, Braun Strowman. Like, it's funny. You look at the Care Bear dude, and a lot of people are going to sit there and say, with this roided up Teddy Ruxpin looking like my roided up Uncle Udo, 350 pound dude you had some sympathy for and after this you had reasons to get even more behind him so it'll be interesting to see how the wwe follows up on this uh, because it might need to lead to some potential changing of plans on the long road as we look ahead to wrestlemania 34 um so in between once the ambulance crash happened and we're waiting for braun to break out Heath slater gets a fucking pay-per-view match against kurt hawkins that's right the man's got kids damn it he's got kids so we got him some pay-per-view time. Just kind of odd because you're getting to the point now. You're looking at the clock. It's 10.50 Eastern time, 9.50 Central. You're like, holy shit, we've still got the Universal title match to go on. How's this going to work? And a lot of people like myself are kind of fearing that this could just be a potential squash, um, that the WWE is going to rush this. Or if anything, we we're going to go over time. And why do we need to go over time? And that's a fair question. Uh, but this Universal title match, I appreciate the way the – that Samoa Joe has been presented so far in this whole program with Brock Lesnar and the fact that he's not afraid, he keeps coming, he's the aggressor, he's not afraid, he's not going to back down, any of that shit. In a world of cookie-cutter chicken shit heels, it's nice to see a villain like a Samoa Joe be presented in that way. And this match started off really hot. At one point in time, I thought that they were going with the Schleg Daddy type of booking of, if you don't have to have the match, then why do it? Why not wait until SummerSlam? Especially once Joe was going out there and throwing Brock through the fucking table. I thought, wow. But then Joe backed off and I'm like, shit. The heat felt like it was there. Why even have the match at that point in time? And looking at the way everything played out, maybe that's the way they should have went. Because this match got off to a really good start. And it was going good. And they were doing a good job of tying it into Suplex City and the Coquina Clutch. Um, I'm a little confused as to why when Samoa Joe's got the Coquina Clutch locked in a couple different times and Brock grabs the ropes... The ref's not immediately counting and threatening to disqualify Joe if he doesn't release the hold. Somebody's got to clue me in on this one. But the match was going really well, and it was starting to feel like a big-time fight. And, you know, you had a bit of a challenge to come back from the shit that happened with the ambulance match because you're not going to be able to back into a fucking pillar or post or anything with your opponent in an ambulance like the previous guys were. So you have to come about this in an entirely different way and still try to get the match over. But they were doing a really good job. And then the finish was really Cena-esque. Like, Joe is majority dominating this match, even with Brock getting in some shit. And then it's an F5 out of nowhere, just one, and the match is fucking over. And you go from, holy crap, this could be really, really good and epic, even if it is going to be a one-off, to where it's like, huh. And you just left unsatisfied. And you've got some people talking about, well, hopefully this leads to a return match between the two of them because of the way Joe was looking at him after the match. I say, at this point in time, why the fuck would you want to have another match? Why would there be a reason to? Joe was the aggressor. Joe cheated, frankly. Joe was kicking his ass for a good portion of it, and it only took one F5, and it was all she wrote. Why the hell do we have a purpose to have another match at this point? I don't see why. You go from this tremendous high of what this night really could have finished off as and what this Universal title match could have finished off as to just sitting there going, what the fuck just happened? And meh. And that really kind of encapsulates this whole night. It really does. Moments of, oh my God, this is really, really good. And then just some booking decisions, in particular the finishes, that make you go, hmm. 
Um, in terms of recapping the night, the moment of the night was Rome, Roman rampaging and then Braun eventually getting busted out by the Giles of Life and stumbling around and going after Roman. That's awesome shit. The surprise of the night was Alexa Bliss's ring work. She's still brutal. I'm surprised she didn't seriously hurt Sasha Banks. This is by far the best I've seen her in the ring in WWE. By far, I think, the best. And I think a lot of people probably agree with that. I think the worst of the night uh, was having Joe do all this and having him look so strong just to have one F5 finish him off. And it ties into the biggest disappointment of the night, which was the Universal title match. You had a really good hot story going into this. This really was hashtag WWE balls. It was great balls of fire. And then the finish happened. And you just left like, eh. And this is like WWE's whole bag. So often, they tease you, they tease you, they tease you. And you get kind of sucked in and you get fooled into thinking that it could be something epic. Like they could finally be doing something right. And then it's like they fuck shit up to spite themselves. They fuck shit up just for the hell of it. They can't help themselves or they don't care or they don't know. And I don't know which one is worse. But it feels like with some of these other matches, if there would have been better stories, those matches would have been better served. And when it comes specifically to this main event, having the finish be done in a different way where at least takes two F5s or maybe three to get rid of Samoa Joe or you don't have the match at all, or you have some type of double count out, some type of washout, double disqualification bullshit, it feels like the night would have ended better. So I don't want to completely crush and bury this show because I had a lot of fun watching it from trying to get hashtag WWE balls trend to some of the stuff that did happen. I'm just really, really disappointed with the way things ultimately ended. And for a show that, like I said during the preview, was really about the two big matches, one of the two big matches really disappointed me it's hard to call this a great show so like i said instead of it being great balls of fire it feels more like it's smoldering nuts or tepid testes but you're free to chime in on what you thought about this show what you thought was the best and worst of the night what you thought about the two big money matches i thank you for taking the time to watch this as we try to hashtag make wrestling fun again make sure you hashtag subscribe or die to this channel if you haven't done so already because remember here at OTRS Central, it's not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.